Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, this is our sixth and final BRT UK Lunchtime Masterclass. So thank you so much for joining us. This week, we are back in the UK with two experts from consultants WSP. Our focus is transport decarbonisation, which with COP26 just behind us is right at the top of the agenda these days. And if it isn't, it should be. It'll be my pleasure to introduce Simon Pope and Tom Gold shortly. One of the joys of this series of BRT UK lunchtime masterclasses is that we have an audience of members who have been with us all the way through, as well as welcoming new people each week. So if this is your first time as uh, part of the audience of one of these masterclasses, I'm James Freeman and I'm chairing today's session. My background is that I took over as chair of BRT UK in February this year, a couple of months before I retired from my job as managing director of Bristol based First West of England, where one of my responsibilities was the introduction of Metrobus BRT services three years ago. BRT UK itself has been around since the early 2000s when that patron of guided buses, Dr. Bob Tebb, decided that a group was needed to put the case for rapid transit using buses. Our purpose is to spread knowledge and share good practice, not just of bus rapid transit, but also for high quality bus operations across the board. We've been absolutely delighted by the response to these lunchtime masterclasses. And so I'm really glad to say that we will have an in-person conference next spring, as I mentioned each time on these sessions, it will be based on Merseyside at the Royal Liver Building in Liverpool on the 16th of March 2022, with a visit to the Lee Guided Busway on the previous afternoon, the 15th of March. So please do make a note of those dates. But meanwhile, here we are for just an hour at lunchtime this Thursday. Short and sharp will be all done by 1.30 in this our sixth lunchtime masterclass and the last in this series, which is a good point to say that we're now considering whether there should be a second series of these masterclasses next year. We're keen to do that, and we'd especially like to know what you, our audience, would like to see for the next session of six. And we're looking for sponsors, too, for each week. Thanks to our indefatigable correspondent from Nottingham, Roger Sexton, for already making a couple of interesting suggestions for topics, but please join him. Do let us know what you'd like to hear more about. Now it's time to introduce our two speakers uh, who are from Consultants WSB. They are Simon Pope, who is Technical Director, and Tom Gold, who is Associate Consultant Transport. As ever, we have a bit less than an hour until we have to finish by half past one. Uh, uh, and Simon and Tom will both speak and also answer your questions. As usual, they will be splitting their uh, presentation into three sections to allow some time for questions and brief discussion as we go along. Uh, please put your points in the chat. As always, please be brief and please be clear. And I'll do my very best to pick them out and put them to Simon and Tom when we pause for questions. Once again, the programme is being recorded because a significant number of people do actually watch it after the event on YouTube over the washing up or whatever it is they're doing. So Simon and Tom, it's my great pleasure to welcome you as our lunchtime masterclass speakers this Thursday. Over to you. Great, what an introduction. Thank you very much. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us. Um, it's very timely that we're actually presenting to you today following COP26 having recently taken place in Glasgow. Now, obviously we don't yet know if COP, how that will help catalyze clear actions as, for us as an industry to tackle decarbonisation, but we do know that there's an acute sense of urgency around the need to act. And given the amount of funding that's being pumped into public transport infrastructure to try and address not just this challenge, but also the government's inclusivity and levelling up agendas, we wanted to ask the question, what does net zero compatible bus infrastructure look like? So I'm Simon Pope, um, I'm joined by my colleague Tom Gold. We're both heavily involved in WSP's work in the transport net zero space. And so we wanted to use this opportunity to reflect on what we think needs to be done to ensure that we're prioritising and investing in the right things to realise a net zero future. Next slide, please. So in terms of an agenda, 
Tom's going to give a quick reminder of the role that transport plays in climate change and the growing recognition of the pathways and difficult decisions needed to decarbonise at the scale and urgency required. We'll then pause to reflect on what Tom has presented, providing an opportunity for you to comment or pose any questions before we then move on to discuss how this affects what type of infrastructure we should be building. We'll then have another pause for questions before exploring how this requires a change in our approach and then I'll close by reflecting on the roles and responsibilities for instigating this change with a further opportunity for comments and questions at the end. Next slide. Before I hand over to Tom, I just wanted to touch briefly on who we are as an organisation. Now I'm proud to say, as geeky as it sounds, that I'm, I'm proud to work for WSP, largely because of the role I have in helping shape or solve what I think is arguably the greatest challenge we face as a society. What do we do? Well, we're the largest supplier of professional advisory services to local government, and we also advise the likes of the subnational transport bodies, the Department for Transport and public transport operators. And it's no exaggeration to say that the climate emergency is currently revolutionising our industry. Now, that can seem a bit of a daunting challenge, but it's also very exciting to be at the forefront of something so important. And as an advisory organisation, we're having to reflect on how to evolve our offer to help the transport sector meet this challenge. Fundamentally, we're seeing a cultural change in how we need to develop infrastructure right across the full project life cycle. And decarbonisation is now often one of the primary drivers to public transport infrastructure development. Even where it's not, we've made a corporate commitment to half the emissions associated with our design advice over the next 10 years. So in summary, decarbonisation is no longer on the fringes. It's very much part of the day to day in terms of what we do. Thanks, Simon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks, Mark. Next slide, please. So just a brief reminder of the challenge um, first uh, that really forms the context of why um, and how we need to reduce transport emissions. I'm sure this is all kind of um, fairly obvious and you're all aware of this, but obviously transport plays a huge role in climate change. Um, in the UK, it's the largest source of emissions, 27% um, in 2019. And of these emissions, the majority comes from cars and taxis. Only 2.5% comes from bus. Next slide, please, Mark. Um, so while net zero is often uh, what steals the headlines, um, really we know that to avoid the worst of climate change, we have to keep our emissions within budgets that follow the limits defined within the framework of the Paris Agreement. This slide shows budgets for transport emissions if we take them as 27% of overall UK budgets. And together, they produce a cumulative budget that we can't surpass. They get progressively lower as time moves on, and this is in order that we emit only a finite amount of carbon that represents our fair contribution to global targets um, and to take us on a trajectory to net zero by 2050. But really, this means that emissions have to fall really fast. Um, but to date, they haven't. Business as usual, transport emissions has been a relatively static line since 1990. We've reduced emissions by only 5%. And as we've seen um, in the news around COP26, the consequence of staying on the business as usual path is potentially over three degrees of warming uh, that could have really catastrophic impacts and increase global exposure to climate hazards. But if we keep within carbon budgets, we can contribute fairly to limiting warming to less than two degrees and hopefully 1.5. So urgent and drastic cuts are needed now if we're to achieve the substantive aims of the Paris Agreement and avoid the worst of climate change. Next slide, please. So what changes have to occur for transport emissions to fall at the required pace? Uh, this slide shows a transport decarbonisation pathway that we've adapted from the Royal Town Planning Institute's Net Zero Transport Report, which I'd really recommend um, you take a look at if you haven't seen it before. Um, it maps out the required steps to reduce emissions by 80% by 2030. And I think the key message to take away from this is that we need to do everything, be ambitious and act fast. No single measure will provide the change that we need, and that includes electric vehicle uptake. The fleet won't be decarbonised quickly enough to reduce emissions on the timescales that we need. So this means we have to reduce car use. The Committee for Climate Change's balanced net zero pathway states a 6% reduction in vehicle kilometres is needed by 2030 and 17% by 2050. And this means we need substitution or avoidance measures to reduce the need to travel and modal shift from car to active and shared modes. But the level of change we now understand is required is transformational and a really significant challenge given that the, the slow progress we've um, had to date. Next slide, please. But of course, it's not on the fringes anymore, uh, the need for action. It's becoming a core objective of investment and policy. And this has been solidified with the government's transport decarbonisation plan their plan across modes to decarbonise transport to net zero by 2050. 
So, you know, is this problem solved? Well, it's of course welcome. Um, and if successful, we're told to reduce emissions as per the graph on the slide. Um, but it's a plan only. It will need ambitious action to implement and a plan is no guarantee of success. And it's not clear yet whether the commitments and pathways set out will act quickly enough to meet carbon budgets on the route to 2050 net zero. It does also acknowledge that electric vehicles, however, will not do all that we need. Um, so there are, of course, you know, a big emphasis on avoid and shift measures, but these are unlikely to go far enough. There's tough policy decisions will be needed, more funding and really tangible action than is defined at the moment. Future iterations of the Transport Decloud Plan um, and supporting policies that hopefully come later, this may well include reform of the road tax system, could be used to drive this behaviour change. Um, but at the moment, uh, the Transport Decloud Plan doesn't commit to this. And a really key point is that time is not on our side. I think that takes us on to first kind of round of questions. If anybody has any um, questions around that kind of principles of this. And uh, as often happens at this point in uh, these conversations, there is yet nothing in the chat at all. So uh, I hope uh, um, our members uh, 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 or the audience are out there and awake. I'm sure you are. Um, if you do have something to, to ask, please do do so. But um, meantime, let's carry on and uh, uh, wait until you said a bit more before we uh, we cross question you. OK, so what, what type of infrastructure do we need to deliver net zero? So next slide, please. So we know the change is required, effectively a reduction in fossil fueled car use by either substituting trips, shifting modes or switching fuels shown in blue. And certain types of infrastructure lead to these sorts of changes, be it infrastructure that reduces the need to travel in the first place or infrastructure that makes, say, bus services more attractive and convenient. Other types of infrastructure, those in pink, work counter to this goal uh, by increasing car use in a time when road travel still emits greenhouse gas emissions. So traditional approaches of predict and provide that build road capacity will grow car use and so in high level terms aren't compatible with that net zero agenda. But in more detailed terms, it's perhaps not always that straightforward. Improving efficiency of traffic flows, for example, can make bus services more reliable and therefore reduce emissions, but efficiencies often then generate induced demand. And even where they don't, a more efficient road network alone won't give us the emission reductions that we need. So we somehow need to tip the balance towards schemes that benefit shared and active modes more than private vehicles. And given the flexibility and coverage of the bus network, its role in maximising that shift in modes is paramount. But we've also got to factor in the carbon involved in construction, operation and maintenance of new public transport infrastructure to understand if and how quickly that carbon debt can be paid back through any user benefits. We also must acknowledge that all construction has a carbon impact, so we can't just build our way out of this, even for a road network that's used by a growing proportion of zero emission vehicles. Next slide. It has to be emphasised in all of this that timing really matters. So firstly, that's around the urgency of change that we've already noted. We only have a finite amount of carbon left to emit. So if we're slow to act, we will exhaust our carbon budgets in this decade. Embodied carbon from construction now risks increasing carbon at the very time we need to see it falling. Secondly, is acknowledging that the carbon impacts of transport will change over time. So the fleet will decarbonise and the market for low carbon construction will accelerate. So that by 2050, any induced demand or embodied carbon from a scheme will have a much reduced impact. But conversely, schemes that substitute trips or critically for us shift modes now will have the greatest impact when the trips avoided are the most polluting. Next slide. Thirdly, is this sweet spot that current alignment with co-benefits provides. So by that, I mean that many of the solutions that shift modes are the same solutions that help tackle public health issues, inequality and the placemaking agenda. So reducing car dominance in our towns and cities by increasing use of bus is therefore a goal of multiple policy objectives. A compelling case for change now that may become diluted as the fleet electrifies. And it's these issues that should steer different priorities in the short to medium term. Investment in bus now offers the opportunity to realise the most rapid change in terms of emissions, whilst also freeing up space to create more attractive place based environments that will be essential if we're to diversify uses in our towns and city centres as part of COVID recovery. 
Thanks, Simon. Next slide, please. So um, in this context, how should we be shaping transport decision making and design so it supports these kind of decarbonisation pathways? In really broad terms, uh, the carbon impact of transport infrastructure comes primarily from user emissions and embodied carbon. Um, but there are also kind of other impacts and opportunities, things like tree loss and tree planting that can also form part of a scheme's impact and have an influence. So the balance of these high level categories of impact, however, make up the net whole life carbon impact of a scheme. And as set out in PAS 2080, which is the industry standard for managing whole life carbon in infrastructure delivery, it's at the earliest stages that you have the greatest opportunity to influence carbon outcomes. But it's at these earliest stages that your assessment that informs carbon reduction is least accurate. At WSP, we've developed our carbon zero appraisal framework on these principles to tackle this challenge and appraise schemes uh, and influence them from early stages, um, informing the selection of best performing carbon schemes and seeking to maximise benefits and minimise impacts throughout development and design. And we found embedding this thinking in decision making and design can enable a carbon culture that can help shape better carbon outcomes. But to illustrate this, um, I'll now run through some uh, what this might look like on two very different types of scheme. And next slide, please. So firstly, um, let's take a new major road scheme. Um, this could be a bypass, for example. On user emissions, this might realise some carbon savings um, from traffic efficiencies that could be reduced journey lengths or stop start traffic. But improvements for private car users will likely have an induced demand that increases car use. Embodied emissions, however, are also really typically quite large for a scheme like this, and ongoing maintenance such as resurfacing will add to its impact. It may also lead to some tree loss, but we'll probably mitigate this through tree planting. But at a simple level, then you would expect a scheme like this over its appraisal period to have an adverse impact to increase carbon emissions. But looking at the profile of those emissions is really important. As shown on this graph of cumulative emissions, the construction embodied impact all incurs, incurs at the beginning of the project, the time when we really urgently need to be reducing emissions. And in the case of a scheme like this, this should of course steer early stage decision making, um, questions such as is it compatible with decarbonisation commitments? And in most cases, new road building probably won't be. But we should also take into account whether the impact can be mitigated or should it be delayed until embodied and induced demand impacts reduce. Should a scheme such as this proceed, however, and there inevitably will be cases where they do, we have a duty to understand its impact from the early stages and take action to minimise. So adopt past 2080 principles, build in costs early, follow carbon construction methods, maximise tree planting, or build in maximum levels of provision for active and shared modes. Next slide, please. So uh, an opposing scenario uh, would be a new bus priority scheme, um, such as a segregated bus lane. By improving bus journey times and making bus thereby a more attractive mode, um, this can be expected to support a modal shift from car to bus that reduces road user emissions. Embodied carbon, however, particularly from a segregated bus lane with plenty of new servicing, concrete for curbs, um, that could erode user benefits. Um, but a scheme like that may also have opportunity for things like tree planting. But overall, in this theoretical example, the scheme gives a carbon benefit, a carbon reduction over its appraisal period. But it has a payback period. Um, in, in this theoretical example, say 10 years, for the user emission benefits to outweigh the carbon debt from construction. So this should really raise into question, is it an over-engineered solution? And is a different design philosophy needed? Um, can the payback period be reduced by choosing a solution that requires less new materials? For example, by reallocating road space instead of widening the highway. Carbon appraisal, however, can give us the ability to understand these issues and have these conversations from the early stages when there's greatest opportunity to influence and shape carbon outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, so these same principles um, can also apply to park and ride development, uh, but the impacts and opportunities can take quite a different shape to schemes within the existing highway. So it's first worth acknowledging that the carbon case for park and ride primarily relates to mode shift, that it captures impacts that would have otherwise traveled by car, traveled further by car, um, but we note that you know there are impacts on travel from park and ride can be that can be more complex than this. But in large rural areas where you can't feasibly service um, you can't feasibly service with a high frequency bus service, we want to maximise the opportunities for people to access the public transport network. And park and ride can offer a means to capture people and get them onto that network, thereby reducing emissions. But park and ride can also have quite a significant embodied carbon impact um, involved in developing what is often greenfield sites. Uh, and the significant new materials and earthworks that can be involved in this. Uh, so more than highway improvement schemes, however, they also have opportunities to provide additional carbon mitigation benefits. This is Sturton Park and Ride in Leeds, um, which we often reference as quite a good example of this. Um, with 15,000 spaces, it captures trips that otherwise would have travelled further, giving the orange carbon saving on this slide. Uh, but the assessment suggested embodied carbon could potentially erode about half of those emission savings. 
But this scheme, however, includes really significant tree planting, um, sequesters carbon, uh, so it's green on that graph. And I mean, that tree planting is also done for other reasons, such as kind of visual screening um, and biodiversity, but it can have a really significant carbon sequestration benefit when planted in the kind of numbers that schemes had the opportunity to. But the scheme also incorporates solar panelled covered canopies, um, which makes it the first solar powered, um, fully solar powered park and ride in the UK. And this mitigates its car energy impact and can feed power back into the grid, while also providing clean energy for electric vehicle charging on site. So in this case, these additional measures really boost the carbon performance of the scheme. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, trade-offs. Um, as the examples that we've just gone through um, show, infrastructure has both beneficial and adverse impacts within it. Um, carbon appraisal is needed to make informed decisions on where there may be trade-offs within these. So, for example, um, tree loss is a really common impact of transport infrastructure where widening the highway might be required, for example, for bus lanes. Um, in this example, we quantified the carbon impact of tree loss and compared this to the anticipated carbon savings from modal shift generated by the journey time savings and continuous bus lane that that continuous bus lane would provide. This showed that from a climate change perspective, that tree loss is justified. And there are, of course, other reasons um, that should be factored into decision making like this and mitigation would be needed. Um, but achieving the scale of mode shift that we know is needed requires us to take some really brave decisions, but we need the right evidence to do that. Next slide, please. So really kind of wrapping up, you know, by understanding the relative performance of a scheme against each of these impacts, um, we can set expectations on how different types of scheme might be optimised for carbon performance. So, for example, if a scheme has quite only modest user emission benefits or may even increase emissions, we should seek to uh, be more ambitious in the provision for active and shared modes and limit benefits to private vehicles that might cause a growth in car use. Schemes with really high levels of embodied carbon may need to revisit what is built, um, perhaps avoiding overly engineered solutions, um, if more ambitious approaches to road space reallocation can achieve the same outcomes. But schemes that uh, struggle in both of these impact categories may have higher expectations for tree planting or things like sustainable energy generation to offset or boost their relative performance. I think that takes us to uh, questions. Brilliant. And uh, indeed, there are quite a number. So that's wonderful. Um, so starting off with uh, John Remington asks, does this need for quick wins? which you mentioned, herald another boom in park and ride schemes generally, car parks with charging points and trees? I think there's certainly a, a, a role for park and ride um, and, in, in terms of providing a, a seemingly relatively quick solution in the, in the scheme of things to, to, to get people to change modes. But obviously there are challenges in, in delivering a park and ride sites um, in terms of you know how they negotiate the planning system and um, they're not without their trade-offs um, and, and the impact for local communities need to be borne in mind um, but it's certainly part of a, a mix of solutions alongside uh, uh, investment in the traditional bus network yeah i mean uh, a, a comment that roger sexton makes it is uh, um, should we really be pursuing park and rides when our aim ought to be to get people to switch mode completely and travel by public transport the whole way. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good point. And I think, you know, the last thing we want park and ride to is to abstract either existing bus users or people who could feasibly use an existing bus service but decide to drive for part of the journey. Mm. I think the, the benefit that park and ride is, you know, from the, the examples that we've, we've mentioned in Leeds and elsewhere, um, they are an attractive mode choice for some car users and that shouldn't you know the benefit of that shouldn't be underestimated i think um we can achieve mode switch on traditional bus services with you know investment in fleet in improvements in journey time and journey time reliability but for the scale of change that we're really looking at securing in, in what tom and i presented thus far it's likely inevitable that we'll, there will need to be further policy intervention to further incentivize that bus use. And, uh, and until that comes forward, be it at a national or regional level, solutions such as park and ride do provide a valuable contribution to play. Yes, interesting comment. Uh, uh, do you think it's possible that people who uh, ride on buses as, as part of a park and ride experience might be more susceptible to use public transport generally, or does it not figure? Certainly, in, in, in I mean, Leeds is, a, where both Tom and I are based, it, it's had a, a quite a good success story on Park and Rise. There's now um, three large operational sites in the city um, and they found that it has attracted a different user that traditionally hasn't used bus services, but it's kind of an entry 
um, experience into the bus network and, and the surveys that the, the council regularly undertakes there does find that as a consequence people are more susceptible to using other forms of public transport um, as a consequence. Yeah so um, Simon Gardner says uh, in Wales they've said they won't build new roads and uh, city centres still have car parks and bus lanes in Cardiff for example have been lost to cycle lanes. Uh, can you see our cities being harder to cut carbon? Sorry, can you sort of clarify the question again? Apologies. Yeah, well, uh, um, so uh, I suppose what this is about is, is it actually more difficult? Uh, this is a political question, really, isn't it? Um, uh, to do the things that need to be done in the urban setting. Um, and what, it's certainly, certainly a challenge, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, Tom kind of alluded to it when he, he said it about do everything, be ambitious and act quickly. You know, there's not a single silver bullet to, to tackle this. Um, fundamentally, we need to have a change in travel behaviour. Um, and that is not, you know, from switch to any single mode, it's going to be a, a suite of different modes that provide that viable solution. Um, what I think is changing is that the, obviously the, the case for investment is going to be made on very different grounds to what has been done in the past um, and what that might mean is that you know bus schemes for, for argument's sake that introduce significant elements of bus priority where that bus priority comes at the expense of say taking away road, road space for other road users often that is can be mired in political controversy but if we're now able to make the case for actually saying well yeah we can deliver this bus lane and deliver those improvements without all this embodied carbon associated with widening the highway very quickly that becomes a, a different debate so I think there are opportunities and, and risks on both sides. That's interesting uh, John Carr says might it might it be better to look at bus priorities on a full route basis so that comprehensive packages including minor highway changes such as improving junction radii or removing car parking are used which have greater public impact than isolated bus priorities. Very much so, I, I very much agree with that and again that's from, from a lot of the work we've worked on um, across West Yorkshire we found that to be the case so you might have had sort of small scale local improvement schemes that have struggled to provide the the strategic justification when brought along in isolation when brought together as a package of a as part of a package of whole route improvements end to end across the corridor and you can actually see the net reliability and journey time benefits that, that provides then very quickly you are able to make that strategic case much more successfully. Mm, good um, just while I'm uh, 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 thinking of details for a minute uh, Stuart and Park and Ride is is uh, how many spaces? 1500 not 15,000 so yeah <laughs> My bad. It's, it's, I think I'm sure someone will correct me but I think it is the largest bus based site in the UK at the moment but it's not that successful that it's 15,000 unfortunately but 1500 <laughs> is still pretty impressive yeah yeah no, it's good um so Matt Gamble come takes us slightly off the bus BRT topic uh but what are your views on the impact of embodied carbon on the overall carbon footprint for new high-speed rail lines uh, is this an argument for focusing on local transport, bus, walk and cycle schemes? That's a very topical question, it is, isn't it? It is, it is <laughs> yes. <laughs> certainly some big numbers for the embodied carbon of a new rail line such as HS2. Um, and yeah, we need to talk about the payback period and the urgency of change. That's, that's certainly a, a question to ask. And I think, I mean, the agenda, you know, and I think everyone's thinking has moved forward so much the last few years so that when many of these major projects were planned, perhaps some of this wasn't fully factored in but yeah. I think as, as well I know a lot of the um, subnational transport bodies like to transport for the north are wrestling with this at the moment in that obviously we need to consider embodied carbon because it has such a massive impact in a time when we need to be cutting carbon but mm. it's also with some of these mega projects it's very hard to understand what the carbon impact of that project is going to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years time because the construction industry is decarbonising at such a pace and it could be very different outcomes based on what we know now to what we envisage it being in the future. So it, it's, a, it's a difficult question to answer but it's certainly a question that does need to be asked. Yeah, interesting. Um, Thomas Lancaster uh, uh, asks, uh, in our spread out rural areas, private car journeys to access urban services tend to be longer. Uh, how do we get the more frequent, more flexible bus, MARS, DRT uh, services that remove these longer car journeys? Um, again, it's a very, very 
good and topical question. I think you know the government's pouring money into infrastructure schemes, so capital spending, but revenue spending is as, as tight as it's ever been. And I think we probably need to think about new commercial ways of running services um, to make them viable um, to I suppose diversify the sorts of services that are able to be provided because I think there is still a tendency to very much focus on the high frequency high demand corridor which don't get me wrong you know they do have the potential to attract a lot of demand but they're not the be all and end all and we need to think about how the wider network as well is served. Mm. So uh, Madeleine Stonehill uh, uh, simply providing infrastructure is meaningless if people aren't incentivized to use it uh, people need to see the real and tangible benefits of BRT corridors over car use Will getting behind the decarbonisation agenda be enough to encourage people out of their cars? We can but hope. Um, I think the you're absolutely right. You know, we can't build our way out of this. Um, I think fundamentally, whilst it's probably not formally recognised in, in government policies, I think everyone understands that, you know, there is going to have to be a reform of the the, the taxation system as, as revenues fall, as the fleet electrifies. And that clearly is a great opportunity to, to, to sort of incentivise or influence how people are travelling. Um, until that point, you know, I think that there is a need to provide infrastructure because the government and, you know, our, our, our elected decision makers need to have the confidence that we're providing viable alternatives for people to switch modes in the first place. Um, what can be achieved without that policy intervention, though, I think we will start to see, you know, as we try and diversify what our town and city centres look like and the opportunities that freeing up road space to give to shared modes and active modes and taking away from cars. I think we are at a tipping point now and people are starting to see that the wider benefits of those sort of interventions that perhaps they haven't always seen in the past. Mm, interesting. Um, a point that was made a bit earlier on in the presentation was, was uh, uh, the fact that there's a sort of timing opportunity um, uh, and that the benefits of uh, bus based solutions may actually get less as the, the car fleet becomes electrified. There are a lot of people who think that, 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 that simply converting all cars to electric will solve all our problems. Um, that was a bit scary, I thought. Yeah, I mean, I think the case for change, you know, it's fundamentally it's not efficient or sustainable for loads of people to be driving around in their own metal boxes when actually we could make those journeys in a more efficient way. And that's not going to change. And, you know, the cases we've said about freeing up road space, creating more attractive city and town centre environments, all those kind of things are going to stay the same. What is going to change, though, is obviously the the, the wider vehicle fleet is going to electrify and decarbonize over time. So I suppose my point really was at the moment we've got all these things that all of them are pointed to the fact that a change in mode is really desirable now. As the fleet electrifies, obviously that argument dilutes on the electrification front, but it doesn't dilute on the other front. So I suppose it's just capitalizing on the opportunities we've got now in the fact that all these policy agendas align and you've, you've, the, the case for, for switching modes is at its strongest, if you like. Mm, good. Right, shall we um, move on then? Right, well, we, I mean, we've talked around kind of individual scheme assessments, um, but when we quantify those, uh, there's also obviously quite a need to assess those at a programme or portfolio level. Um, so in doing so, it's really important to recognise that even the small schemes uh, can play a role, quite a big role in our meeting our net zero targets. Um, while some of these may predict a more modest carbon saving in absolute terms, as seen on the blue bars on this slide, um, they may in aggregate represent a better value for our investment if the costs involved are more proportionate. Uh, it's for this reason that we've developed a um, carbon cost ratio metric that enables a comparison of carbon value. Using this metric, we can standardise schemes of different size, gauging their scale of carbon impact per million pounds of capital investment. And in the example shown here, we can see how smaller scale extensions of existing park and ride sites offered a greater carbon impact per million pounds of investment than the new uh, standalone sites where the greater impact of construction tempered the relative carbon performance. And as we move away from the more traditional economic arguments um, when demonstrating the case for investment, this understanding of carbon impact uh, must become um, as fundamental to project as capital cost. And while infrastructure does represent a part of the jigsaw, um, our appraisals demonstrate the limitations of what infrastructure alone can deliver, as we've just touched on, signposting that parallel policy interventions will, be need, to will need to be layered on top Next slide, please. So um, another key design decision that we've got to look at from a carbon lens relates to travel demand. Um, traditional predict and provide transport planning has catered for forecasted increases in traffic growth, 
but we do know this is outdated uh, and not compatible with decarbonisation pathways. So as shown on this slide, um, in comparison to forecast predictions of traffic growth, decarbonisation pathway studies are showing as private car travel must fall by as much as 21% in the case of West Yorkshire, um, undertaken within their carbon emission reduction pathway study. Although the viability of this will, of course, you know, change between rural and urban areas. But it's really clear, you know, while traditionally we've planned for increase in traffic growth, we know that car use needs to fall. So we should also have a question how travel demand will change. Um, this will be influenced by population and socioeconomic context, COVID and other factors. Uh, but if it is going to grow, however, it needs to be on different modes to be compatible with decarbonisation and parallel agendas such as health and placemaking. So for decisions in the development of bus infrastructure schemes, it should mean we're designing a travel system for the travel behaviours we need. It should mean a strengthened case for road space reallocation, accepting that highway disbenefits on the basis, accepting occasional highway disbenefits that may result from re road space reallocation on the basis that car use needs to fall and disbenefits to private car users um, where there's sust improved sustainable mode alternatives can actually result in additional levels of mode shift and hopefully the evaporation of resulting congestion. So, but this obviously needs a strong evidence base, um, needs evolved appraisal methodologies and strong political will to overcome some of the challenges associated with this. But decarbonisation can give us this opportunity to deliver a cost effective sustainable transport network and hopefully to turn a corner on car dependency. Next slide, please. So I mean, we've um, focused on reducing carbon emissions to mitigate climate change, uh, but the other half of the climate emergency is resilience and adaption. Proper consideration of whether infrastructure is resilient to climate change has traditionally been limited to major schemes, um, often those subject to planning applications and environmental impact assessment, flood risk assessments. Um, but many local infrastructure, often delivered through permitted development rights, doesn't often formally consider the risks from a changing climate and the opportunities to support our adaption to, the, uh, to climate change. And these same principles apply um, as carbon apply here, that we need to consider resilience early and build adaption into design. Otherwise, it can result in expensive and delaying changes to design to incorporate measures such as enhanced drainage or materials that are more resilient to future rainfall projections. Um, or failing any consideration um, of resilience could mean we're building infrastructure that isn't future ready and could fail under future conditions with the disruption and maintenance burden that this could cause. Next slide, please. Um, as we mentioned, I mean, we've applied this approach uh, to major transport investment programmes, such as the Leeds City Region Transforming Cities Fund and Leeds Public Transport Investment Programme. Uh, we've used emission calculation tools, data sets um, in unison with professional judgment and input from the specialists who best understand the schemes to report on whole life carbon and resilience and use this to challenge design. Um, Simon also mentioned earlier our commitment to half the emissions from our designs. Um, so with this process, you know, we're embedding this in our uh, process of transport planning services to inform what schemes are developed and how. Next slide, please. OK, so just to sort of close out on a little on roles and responsibilities. Uh, next slide. So clearly there's a big gap between current trends and the targets that aim to mitigate global warming to a scale that will avoid its worst effects. Transport is the largest emitter in the UK must reduce its emissions rapidly if we're going to achieve this. Now we have an opportunity to lead the world in transport decarbonisation and achieve all the co-benefits that potentially come from that. But the transformational change of the transport system to one that is low carbon needs to be matched by a transformational change in the way we as a public transport industry plan and deliver infrastructure. This can't be championed only by the environmental profession. It needs a change in culture so that carbon is something everyone has the skills and responsibility to tackle. Improving methods of carbon appraisal can help inform the decisions we take, but it requires transport practitioners and decision makers to ask the right questions and take action in the first place. I think the decarbonisation agenda provides a real opportunity to increase the role of the bus industry, but it requires us to present a carbon literate argument to underpin associated investment. Fundamentally, net zero won't happen without the skills and innovation we are able to contribute. Next slide. So the Prime Minister has spoken about how COP must keep 1.5 alive. And if we're successful in this, it translates to urgent and extensive cuts in emissions that can only come from a transformational change in our approach, requiring that we all start to adopt the kind of thinking that we've covered in this presentation. 
The UK commitments to carbon budgets are amongst the ambitious in the world and are consistent with a 1.5 degree rise in temperatures that was agreed in Paris. But the scale of this challenge shouldn't be underestimated. However, if we mobilise to deliver as a public transport industry, we could be at the start of a golden age for bus, not just as a mode of transport, but also as an enabler to realising the sort of society that we want to become. The consequences, if we don't grasp that nettle now, will be much more damaging and severe for us all. I think that concludes the presentation. I think we've got more questions. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, uh, Recently, the BBC somewhere ran a programme in which they talked about, um, you know, what was the greenest way of travelling and they came out with an electric car was brilliant and going on the bus because it was diesel was not good. Um, and actually that scared, uh, uh, <laughs> scared me anyway, uh, um, a great deal. Um, does the fact that the, the the transport fleet, I mean, you were showing lots of pictures there of uh, of buses which are, are still diesel buses. I mean, there are, you know, the vast bulk of the public transport offer is still, even if it's Euro 6, and that's very much cleaner than previous generations of diesel engines. But the fact is, we are going to be dependent on, a, on an awful lot of vehicles which are not as clean as an electric um, Tesla or whatever it might be. Yes, but obviously, you know, the, the, the bus fleet itself will decarbonise over time. Um, and, you know, I come back to my earlier point, I suppose, that fundamentally, regardless of pe whether people are driving electric vehicles or not, it's not sustainable for us to continue making private vehicle journeys to the levels that we have because of the embodied carbon involved in construction of those vehicles in the first place and the embodied carbon in, involved in construction the, the the roadways that they run on and maintaining those roadways etc so there does need to be a shift to shared modes where they provide a viable alternative and you're right you know we do need to expedite the electrification of the bus fleet but you know as a more sustainable and efficient way of transporting a large volume of people clearly it's got a significant role to play Yes, although I suppose the key to all of this and what you've been both of you have been saying today is the extent to which politicians can be convinced to run with the solutions that um, this points to. Um, what's your sense? Uh, uh, I don't want you to to compromise yourselves with your with your clients, but what's your sense in terms of uh, the realities of this? I, I mean, have we got the message? I think, I mean, the great majority of, of local authorities in the UK and, and our clients have declared uh, a climate emergency um, several years ago now. Um, and there was almost a, a kind of race to the bottom in terms of like who can get to net zero fastest and the government's committed to 2050 and then some authorities are saying 2040 and then other authorities are saying 2030. If I'm honest, I don't think anyone really thought about the implications of what that means. Now we are starting to see that and we're you know, in, in almost all the conversations we're having with our clients, it's, you know, what do we need to do to get to that point? And that's because they're being driven by their political masters who are asking that very question. And so I think the penny is starting to drop. I think it's alarming for some authorities as to the kind of scale of behavioural change that's going to be necessary and how they can actually deliver that without national government intervention. But I think also at national levels, it's understood that the national government does need to intervene. It's just when that's actually going to happen and is it going to be soon enough? Very interesting. I mean, I, I've come across uh, uh, situations where national government is, uh, as it were, telling local government to get on with a bus priority and all the rest of it. But when the local authority actually seeks to take away the parking in front of X and Y and Z um, local traders, uh, they find they're on their own and it's just uh, politically suicidal, they would think, um, to pursue that line of attack. And, uh, do, we, do, do we think there's any sense that we are getting past that point? I, I would say that the to date we've probably not had the evidence we need to make the case on, on climate grounds to the extent that we would want to. So, yeah, you know, it, it's clear to say that, you know, traveling by shared and active modes on the face of it would seem to be more sustainable than traveling by private car but actually talking about the the numbers and being able to evidence things so tom referenced in in some of his slides about where we were widening to deliver a bus lane and that impacted on trees and, and people quite rightfully were saying well if this is a, a scheme to tackle climate emergency surely we don't want to be taking out trees but historically we've not always had the evidence to be able to say well actually these 
trees sequester this amount of carbon, but actually the benefits from providing this bus lane once people switch onto bus is this amount of carbon. We've got very clear evidence on which to make decisions, and I don't think we've always had that in the past, which means that some of those debates haven't really happened. Mm, I mean, one of the things that Tom said, which um, I thought was pretty striking, was that a 21% of cut of uh, private car travel was needed to to make some progress. That is a, a massive step change, is it not? It is, but particularly when you think about the fact that, um, you know, in, in certain locations, you're always going to struggle to, to switch people onto active and shared modes. So actually in the locations where you can switch people onto active and shared modes, that percentage change is going to be much even, even greater. John Carr says in the, in the chat, um, uh, in the case of go ahead uh, uh, air, uh, air cleaner buses, uh, they are less bad per passenger journey and bring other health benefits, but the bus industry doesn't blow its own trumpet enough. Uh, how do we make them do that better? I think it comes it comes down to sort of carbon literacy more generally. Um, I think all of us who are involved in the transport industry are going to have to become very conversant with carbon and understanding the implications of carbon in part of our decision making. At the moment, it's still not as as, as integrated into our thought process as as things like cost and, and time and all the other things that safety, you know, the, the things that have traditionally um, influenced our, our decision to, to invest, whereas I think very quickly carbon will become that case and, and, and therefore, you know, the likes of the, the private bus operators and others will start to see the benefits of, of championing that cause. Yes, well, it's a, um, it's a big shift of thinking, isn't it? Uh, um, and it does require a political uh, leadership. I'm mean, interesting that uh, COP26 and all the government the conversations around that uh, point in the right direction. But I suppose for those of us down who just, you know, bus users, uh, is that going to convert into into reality? Yeah, the million dollar question, I suppose. <laughs> I, I, I do think though that, that that we have reached a, a bit of a turning point, and and clearly COP has has been a um, a particular focus in the press more recently. But you know, we're seeing now in in all of the funding that's being released from government for for transport investment, the the, the climate strings that are associated, uh, you know, attached to that. Um, I think that whilst perhaps historically there's been a focus on you know how climate is a constraint to economic development i think what we'll start to see soon is actually those countries or regions that are really adopters to this approach will actually see the economic benefits of that and very quickly there will be a rush towards you know investment in in green solutions because they'll seem to be the future of, of where society is going yeah yeah uh, matt gamble asked in in the in the uh, the chat uh, while town centres and out of town shopping centres compete for business with each other, is there any alternative to the race to zero for parking charges? Uh, and hence, is there anything other than limited scope to get mode shift to sustainable modes? Uh, um, parking charges getting cheaper and cheaper or being removed altogether? I mean, I, I completely understand, you know, perhaps outside of the, the, the larger urban centres where you've got smaller urban centres that are competing with each other and out of town locations, as you say, I can understand the, the nervousness and reluctance of local politicians to, 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 to introduce parking charges that seemingly deter um, the appeal of those centres, particularly on, you know, on the back of COVID when a lot of centres are struggling to find what their niche is and what their purpose is. Um, that said, I think, um, at a more broader national level, as I touched on earlier, you know, there is looming reform on the back of um, the taxation system, uh, you know, falling fuel duty, falling road tax based on how those two um, sources of funding for the Exchequer are currently calculated. And so it's not unreasonable to expect that a future reform of that is going to be based on some form of carbon tax. You know, the technology exists to ensure that that is delivered in such a way that it doesn't penalise the most vulnerable in society. Um, and I suspect it's actually that that's going to be the instigator of change rather than relatively blunt instruments like you know, parking charges that have, have been available to date. So if we take all that you've both said today and uh, go back to the beginning of, of, our, of our, our conversations, um, do you think that uh, there is going to be a, a window for park and ride schemes, for example, um, to get uh, to get things moving or or what? 
Um, I, th I think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, park and ride as part of a, a mix of different solutions. And, I, you know, I wouldn't want us to just focus on park and ride because actually the, the, the traditional bus network um, carries an awful lot more passengers and has got the scopes carrying an awful lot more passengers. Uh, I think it's it's a, a suite of different solutions tailored to the appropriate environment that they're built in. And I think what we caution or I suppose advise is that scheme promoters think carefully about what they're proposing at the outset and then try and understand the carbon implications of what they're proposing at the outset because in, in as part of any scheme whether it's a bus lane a park and ride scheme or reallocation of road space whatever it might be you need to ensure that you're optimizing the design and delivery of that infrastructure to maximize the carbon benefits that stand to be gained um, and if that means we need to deliver in a slightly different way you know the earlier you understand those implications the more likely you are to actually realize them yeah, so uh, uh, thank you. A comment in, in uh, just in from David Jenkins. The places generally quoted as having good bus services are all, by coincidence, those places where parking is difficult. Brighton, Cambridge, Exeter, Oxford, Reading. Um, is there a connection, do you think? I think certainly there's, you know, as I'm sure through any operators on, on the presentation would testify that, you know, that w once you start to get um, sustained demand growth, um, then obviously that gives you the opportunity to invest in fleet, invest in frequency, invest in quality, and then it also be almost becomes self-fulfilling. I think what we've struggled to do is that in a lot of parts of the UK, obviously operators have been struggling with declining patronage for various reasons, and it's very difficult to turn that round without a coordinated and uh, um, a coordinated sort of focus. Um, but you know there are plenty of examples outside of those centres that have been mentioned where that has been achieved. It's just, can we achieve it at the scale required in the time required without more significant policy intervention? Indeed. Overall then, uh, to conclude, are you both optimistic? I think we have to be, don't we? <laughs> It's quite easy to kind of, um, you know, I, sometimes I, this I kind of living and breathing the, the net zero stuff for some time now, as has Tom. And, you know, when you, you've got the cold hard facts in front of you and the, the, the detail of the scale of the challenge, it can seem very daunting. But I do think there is hope. And, I, you know, even in the past 6, 12, 18 months, I've noticed a massive shift in, in attitudes and, and approaches to this. I think COVID's shown what we can really achieve as a society when we absolutely have to. Um, I think perhaps it's not quite on the absolutely have to level yet. It's not far off, but it's certainly rising up that political agenda. So I think, yeah, you know, necessity is the mother invention. We, we, we can certainly turn things around. It's just having the appetite and the willingness to do so. I like that, you know, everybody is on board with the idea that we need to mitigate climate change and the significant consequences if we don't. I think it's almost just translating this into the really tangible actions and decisions a bit lower down, as we talked about earlier. But um, if we can join that, those two levels, um, it should absolutely be doable and we have many of the technical solutions we need it's just kind of upping ambition i guess and providing the evidence to, to justify it upping ambition that's a very good point at which to uh conclude your uh, uh session this afternoon uh I, I think that's been absolutely fascinating and uh uh, a, a huge thank you to Simon and Tom for uh, uh, um, a session which will make us go away and look more carefully at those slides, I think. And uh, uh, thanks as ever to all of you, our audience, for your interest and for all your comments and questions. Don't forget now that this programme has been recorded and will be available through Landor Links which makes me say that I'd also like to thank the team at Landor Links, especially Mark, who's been behind the slides today, and Juliana, who've worked so hard behind the scenes over the last uh, six weeks to make these programmes work. As I said at the start, we are considering a, a follow-up lunchtime masterclass series for next year, so do let us know what topics would interest you, or indeed whether you uh, would like to be chosen to give a future masterclass your own. If so, please contact me, James Freeman, uh, via the BRT UK website. We'll also be looking for sponsors for the next series. So if that's an opportunity for you, uh, do consider um, working or coming forward to uh, uh, look at sponsoring the lunchtime masterclasses next year. And don't forget the dates of our first upcoming in-person conference in Liverpool. Uh, which are 15th and 16th of March 2022. So if you're interested, please do keep those days clear in your diaries and there'll be more details closer to the time. 
So uh, as we bring this short series of BRT UK Lunchtime Masterclasses to its conclusion, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you for joining us and equally uh, uh, a heartfelt thanks to our speakers today, Simon and Tom, for doing us proud. I hope we'll meet again next year, but for now, this is James Freeman signing off for BRT UK. Goodbye.